Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. Decided not to take a day off today. There is simply too much to cover. I'm feeling a little bit better. Thank you very much, everybody, for your words of encouragement and support over the last few days. First up, Hong Kong's fund managers have called on the government to reopen the borders of the financial megacity, warning that the tight restrictions are driving a permanent exodus of highly skilled talent, exacerbating a trend that was already underway since the passage. Of the controversial national security law back in 2020, Sally Wong, chief executive of the Hong Kong Investment Funds Association, which represents global and local groups that oversee more than 52 trillion dollars in assets under management, led these calls for loosening after outgoing chief executive Kerry Lam said yesterday, Tuesday, that no such easing was going to happen and that things would return to normal after the pandemic ends. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region has employed, arguably under pressure from Beijing, a relatively tight COVID policy, including strict border controls since the start of the pandemic, and the effect on talent retention has been felt across Hong Kong's critical financial sector. According to the chief executive of Hong Kong's de facto central bank this week, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority lost seven percent of its staff in 2021, roughly double the annual average of three to four percent. Most of the losses involved professionals with technical expertise in the HKMA's Technology Supervision Department and Digital Office. Hong Kong Securities Watchdog, the Securities and Futures Commission, also faces a loss of talent, with staff turnover more than doubling to 12 percent in 2021, from 5.1 percent the previous year. The Securities Watchdog cited border controls and talent exodus as the primary reasons for the shortage. And it is not just individuals that are leaving, but companies as well. According to a survey published in March by the European Chamber of Commerce, nearly half of European companies in Hong Kong are looking to leave this year. Since the beginning of this year, 2022, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region has seen a net loss of about 130,000 residents, and in Q1, the economy contracted 4%. Year on year. If you're enjoying the video, don't forget to the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help keep the channel sustainable, Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, crypto links are in the description below. As always, everybody, thank you so much for the ongoing support. Next up, as we discussed in yesterday's video, since、uh, late April, several rural banks in Henan Province froze customer accounts, sparking concerns about the health of the national financial system. The vulnerability of smaller rural banks, as well as bank fraud, the account freezes resulted in angry small-scale protests in the provincial capital of Henan, Zhengzhou. The situation has now mutated into a fresh scandal, which has sparked national outrage online, drawing both netizen and even state media criticism. On June 13, complaints emerged on Chinese social media that authorities in the city of Zhengzhou appeared to be using the health risk score system to target bank depositors nationwide, whose funds were frozen by banks in Henan. Local authorities in Zhengzhou yesterday denied that the code changes were intentional, claiming that there was just a malfunction at a big data center. Every person in the country is required to have a health code on their phone. A green health code is required to enter most spaces and use transportation. In theory, the system is designed to prevent people from high-risk COVID areas from moving in low-risk populations. Thus, by targeting the health codes of bank depositors whose funds were frozen by the banks, it was made impossible for them, for these people, to travel to Zhengzhou to protest. However, this very naked example of abusing the health code system by local security organs has caused national outrage. One post from a legal expert, which went viral and tellingly was not censored, expressed: "Quote: Officials may have violated criminal law by abusing a health code system designed for pandemic control to block the mobility of petitioners." End quote. One law professor at prestigious Tsinghua University in Beijing expressed online, quote, "Officials involved in the matter should take legal responsibility for violating criminal law by abusing their power." End quote. 
Even state media was critical, with the People's Daily WeChat account expressing in a piece, quote, What is the legal basis for using the health code measures taken to make the epidemic more scientific and accurate for other purposes? Have you ever thought about the consequences of abusing epidemic prevention means and breaking rules? End quote. China analyst Bill Bishop hit the nail on the head when he expressed on this development today, quote, Messing with their health code certainly is cheaper and easier than meeting someone with multiple police officers as they arrive in the province, but this may have blown up in their faces. Now everyone knows that certain relevant organs can manipulate your health code status. End quote. And finally, let's end with the housing sector. And for today, I wanted to explore an excellent article published today by several analysts with Chinese financial outlet Taishin called China's efforts to prop up property market fall short. The article brings together several key themes of the housing sector and the general developer crisis or housing crisis that China has seen over the last half year or so, which we have been discussing in recent months. Uh, for today, let's look more at the demand side issues, and later at the week we will explore the supply side issues. The authors in the article argue that China's real estate market, quote, has been in free fall for months after tough regulatory curbs on developers' borrowings pushed it into a crisis of liquidity and confidence. This line in particular, crisis of liquidity and confidence, I think is particularly accurate. According to data from property consultancy China Real Estate Information Corp., though around 100 cities eased their property policies in May, the sales of the top 100 developers were still down 59.4% year on year though they saw a modest rise of 5.6% month on month. However, the month before was also a particularly bad month in terms of sales. The authors of this article argue what we've been saying for some time now, that the changes to government policies haven't done much to stimulate either supply or demand. So far, as policymakers struggle to balance the need to control debt risks and maintain housing price stability while still achieving growth, something that sounds like an impossible trinity to some. Dozens of cities have cut mortgage rates and lowered down payment requirements by 10 percentage points to 20% of the property price. But these policies have had very limited effects. Most larger cities only relax down payment requirements for first home buyers. But as we have seen before, many buyers previously already had one or more properties something which by itself is a red flag that you're dealing with a speculative market. Additionally, first-tier cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, haven't changed these rules at all. Analysts argue that policymakers' fears about China's rising household debt situation are making them cautious about lowering down payment requirements. Of course, with a housing crisis and zero COVID lockdowns, household confidence has been hit hard. But even if confidence was strong, there remain serious constraints on the demand side as well. As we have seen, according to the National Institute of Finance and Development, the household leverage ratio, outstanding household debt as a share of nominal GDP, surged to 62.2% at the end of 2021, from 39.2% in 2015 and 17.9% in 2008. On the face of it, this doesn't appear to be too bad. However, household debt as a percentage of disposable household income is much more concerning, reaching 130% last year. We remember that a low share of China's national GDP is taken by household income compared with developed economies. This high level of debt to income has also bitten into household consumption. And God help them if interest rates start jumping like we are now seeing in other countries. Quote, some economists are worried that, if household debt continues expanding amid rising housing prices, mortgage interest payments may eventually outstrip family incomes, which could lead to a debt crisis and pose a threat to the financial system. End quote. Okay, that is our episode for today. Thank you everybody for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.